Before we jump into the latest video, we need to unroll the map of the battlefield to see where our opposing sides are located. Should you watch any of their videos about the Godhead, you'll find the same basic presentation if you understand the Godhead from Scripture. Jesus Christ is the physical body of the Godhead. God the Father is the soul. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit. Okay, you understand that? Or you could say the Holy Ghost is the Spirit. That's the Godhead. You know, the Bible teaches that there are three aspects to the Godhead and that they have different things that they can do, but yet they're all one in one body. All right, if you believe that Jesus Christ is, you know, one body, that's not denying the Trinity, all right? The three parts of the one body is Jesus is the body, God is the soul, the Holy Ghost is the spirit. There's three, okay? That's not denying the Trinity. It's craziness. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Proven fact. One God made up of a body, a soul, and a spirit. Three in one. It's what the Bible teaches. And the Godhead is God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all three are one. Not in essence, the three are one. The Bible teaches that in Jesus Christ, in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The book of Colossians talks about that. So you have Jesus Christ being the, the body, God the Father being the soul, and the Holy Ghost obviously is the Spirit. That's why the Bible talks about man being created in God's image. All right, It's three in one. Now, Bible believers are going to look at that, and they're going to say, see, Holy Ghost is God, not God the Spirit. Why? Because it doesn't say that in the text. Okay? God is three parts. God the Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Ghost. These three are one. One. Jesus Christ is the image of God the Father. And the spirit that's in the Godhead there is the Holy Ghost. It's easy to figure that thing out. Because it, is it easy to figure out what the Bible says and think? Yeah. Is it easy to understand how that works and how that the three can separate themselves as far as the three, you know, body over here, soul over there, spirit over there? No, I don't quite understand all that stuff. But uh, they're not three separate persons. Why? Because the Bible doesn't say that they're three separate persons. On this side, we have the Godhead, one person with a body, soul, and spirit, three in one. I've always taught that God is three parts in one body. It's one God in three parts, okay? And I know some brainiac uh, Trinity person is going to say, where does it say three parts? Where's the three parts? Okay, whatever you want to call it, all right? I know you people are brain dead, and you have to try to spell everything out for you people and whatever else but the whole point is god made man in his own image singular all right in his image not in his images of the three different you know whatever let us make man in our image one okay one image there but it's composed of three parts body soul spirit I have a body, soul, spirit. Because what the Bible teaches about the Godhead, there are three in one. Man is created in the image of God. Man has a body, soul, spirit. Three in one. But there's enough given in Scripture that you can see how it works. Body, soul, spirit. These three are one. Those three can separate. You'll see that all throughout the Bible. Those three can be separate. They can function independently of each other. But they don't, when Jesus leaves, when he's not part of the Godhead there, as far as, you know, when he's dying on the cross and things, he doesn't have his own soul and spirit separate from God, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. No, it's the three of them together. But then the soul leaves, the spirit leaves. Jesus Christ died on the cross. God, the Father, didn't die on the cross. The soul, or excuse me, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, did not die on the cross. He gave up the ghost. Remember? 
What does he say about the Father? Why hast thou forsaken me? I've been teaching for years that the Godhead consists of Jesus, the body, God, the soul, the you know, the God, the Father, the soul, and the Holy Ghost is the spirit. Three parts of one being. Um, but me being a Bible-believing Christian that believes in the biblical Godhead, I look and I say, well, God and, you know, the God, the Father and Jesus Christ are the same being. Uh, God is the soul. Jesus is the body. Holy Ghost is the spirit. But no problem. According to this passage, God the Father is not the Father of Jesus. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, I can look at that thing and I can say, well, it's no problem at all because the Godhead is Jesus as the body, the Father as the soul, and the Holy Spirit as obviously the Spirit. No big deal. So, God the Father can be involved and the Holy Spirit can be involved. Here he is, God manifest in the flesh. And his soul was the Father and his Spirit is the Holy Ghost. Right there, the Godhead, as a baby. Now, I've been saying this for a long time, these different studies. We are made in the likeness of God. God has three parts to him. Body, soul, spirit. And I get called a heretic because I teach the biblical Godhead that Jesus is the body. The Father, in whom my soul is well pleased, speaking down from heaven. And now, the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of the Lord. Right there, it's proven. Bible believers like myself, we believe in the biblical Godhead. The word Trinity is not a Bible word. We believe in the biblical Godhead, and the Godhead is body, soul, spirit. Three different parts to one being. Trinitarians, they hear us and they say, they hear us say, they're just one. Jesus is God, and his, He is God, the flesh, the Father is the soul, and the Spirit there is the Spirit of the Godhead. These three are one. Jesus Christ is only one being. And He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all in one being. Right? But they say, oh, no, it's the teaching that Jesus is, you know, both Father and Son and Holy Spirit in one being. Uh, well, that's what the Bible teaches. And again, I've proved that in multiple studies. Uh, or you could just believe what the Bible teaches about the Godhead and say, no, they're actually just three parts to one being. Body, soul, spirit. There you go. Not that hard. The world doesn't know who the Father was. It knew Him not. He's on the earth walking around in Jesus Christ. Body, soul, spirit, you see. God is the soul. Jesus Christ is the body. When you were looking at the body, Jesus Christ, you were looking at the Father as the soul inside of Jesus Christ. But we'll look also at the written statements. From Denlinger's website, we believe that the Godhead consists of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Bible teaches that these three are separate and yet equal in their power and authority. While they are separate in their functions, they are all part of one single body. In other words, we do not believe in three gods, but in one God made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And then from Jacob's book, page 172. 1 Timothy 6.15 says, speaking of Jesus Christ, is the blessed and only potentate. Wait a minute. If he is the only one that is omnipotent, then what does that do for the Father and the Spirit? On top of that, look at verse 16 where it says, still speaking of Jesus Christ, who only hath immortality. Again, what do you do with the Father and Spirit there? Don't they have immortality? By all means, yes. So what does this teach us? It teaches us that Christ is God. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And those three are one making the Godhead, which is Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 7, Colossians 2, 8 through 10, Romans 1, 19 and 20, and John 14. When the Bible speaks of there being only one God, this one God is Jesus Christ. You can see this demonstrated further by how the clear attributes of the Father, whom no man hath seen nor can see, are spoken of belonging to Jesus Christ. At a recap, God is composed of three parts, body, the Son, soul, the Father, and spirit, the Holy Spirit. One person is formed of these three parts, Jesus Christ. God is a single being, person. Each of these three parts enjoys an eternal relationship with the others.
Note the divine body, soul, and spirit are personal and bear a personal relation to the other parts. They're not impersonal relations, such as a tree root and a tree, but personal, such as the biblical language used of father and son. They are constituent parts of the Godhead, which is likewise personal. Now, we'll delve into other points later, but for now we'll briefly lay out the orthodox doctrine regarding God and the Trinity before contrasting the differences, because it is vital that we understand what they are objecting to and how their doctrine differs from it, not merely in the words, but in the meaning. We'll use the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, 1689, chapter 2 as the basis of our comparison and point out the presence of certain terms and their uses. My intention here is to merely state what my doctrinal position is. Paragraphs 1 and 2 deal with God's existence and essence or attributes. Paragraph 1. The Lord our God is but one only living and true God, whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, every way infinite, most holy, most wise, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will, for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. Now the confession notes that there is only one living true God. This is the foundational point in Trinitarianism and the most basic statement of God from Scripture, monotheism. Throughout this chapter, the affirmation of the existence of only one God will be restated several times. Next, his subsistence is in and of himself. There's no higher cause or principle by which God exists. He is the sufficient reason for his existence. He is not dependent upon anything else for himself. Next, he is infinite in being and perfection. God cannot become more than he is or more perfect in any of his attributes than he is. For God is not becoming, but he is, I am. Next, his essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself. Now, our knowledge of God, true and guided by the Holy Spirit through the word of God, can never be comprehensive. The fullness of the knowledge of God cannot be contained within our finite ability of understanding. We will never be able to plumb the depths of God's being. We may apprehend God in truth without fully comprehending him. And this is a point of commonality between the orthodox doctrine and the Godhead proponents. Next, a most pure spirit, invisible. As Stephen Sharnock states it in his Existence and Attributes of God, Discourse 3, that is, he hath nothing corporeal, no mixture of matter, not a visible substance, a bodily form. He is a spirit, not a bare spiritual substance, but an understanding, willing spirit, holy, wise, good, and just. To note, this is not speaking of Father, Son, or Spirit particularly, in distinction to one another, but God himself. Yes, God, whether we refer to the Father, Son, or Spirit, is invisible. Next, without body, parts, or passions, he has no body. He is incorporeal, as detailed in the point before. Further, he is without parts, that is, he is simple. This term denies of God all manner of composition, whether physically, logically, or metaphysically. God's attributes are not superadded to what he is, but are identical with him. God's attributes are his essence. What God is, is single, not because he is several things unified, but because his essence is devoid of any partness. Still further, he is without passions. He is impassable. This means he is not a passive recipient of emotions or states of being based on something outside of himself. Again, what he is, he is perfectly and eternally. The creature cannot affect God and bring him into another state making him either more or less than he is absolutely. Next, he alone has immortality. He is immutable and most absolute. As God does not receive anything which he is from anything outside of himself, he does not change and is without end. He is most absolute, that is, 
as there is nothing that is not God which makes him to be what he is, he is independent of anything as necessary to him that is outside of himself. Paragraph 2 reads, God, having all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself, is alone in and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creature which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his glory in, by, unto, and upon them. He is the alone fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. And he hath most sovereign dominion over all creatures, to do by them, for them, or upon them, whatsoever himself pleases. In his sight all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature, so as nothing is to him contingent or uncertain. He is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, and in all his commands. To him is due, from angels and men, whatsoever worship, service, or obedience, as creatures they owe unto the Creator, and whatsoever he is further pleased to require of them. This chapter reiterates in more specifics that God is absolute and perfect in his being, and requires nothing of any creature for his own existence in any respect, or betterment in any respect. Again, says God, having all life in and of himself, is alone in and unto himself all-sufficient. Again, monotheism is affirmed. The third paragraph. In this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences, the Father, the Word or Son, and Holy Spirit, of one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, all infinite, without beginning, therefore but one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties and personal relations. Which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on Him? Now, first, it states, in this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences, the Father, the Word or Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are said to be three subsistences in the divine being. Second, of one substance, power, and eternity, each having a whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. Here's our affirmation of the unity of substance between Father, Son, and Spirit. By being of one substance, recall that from paragraph 1 that God is without parts, we deny that there are three things, three powers, or three eternals. Further, Father, Son, and Spirit each has the whole divine essence and the essence undivided. All that chapters 1 and 2 predicate of God is possessed by Father, Son, and Spirit. None has a partial eternity or partial power or authority over another because each is the one God. Again, we find simplicity being a key within this whole doctrine. The key to God's absoluteness is simplicity, and the key to the three subsistences not devolving into tritheism is simplicity and unity of essence. Next, the fathers of none neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. Here the eternal generation of the Son and eternal spiration of the Spirit from the Father and the Son are given as being the way of distinguishing between the three and the basis for the outward manifestation of the triune God's works. Next, all infinite, without beginning, therefore but one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties and personal relations. It is stated again that Father, Son, and Spirit are all infinite, all without beginning, and only one God, not divided in nature and being, but the three subsistences are distinguished by relative properties, not essential ones. We deny that there is an essential difference between Father, Son, and Spirit. Having laid out what their doctrine is, and what the doctrine of the Trinity is, we will quickly contrast the points of divergence. Now, using different words doesn't necessarily entail a difference in meaning, but in this case, we do have different end results, so we need to know what is being said. To summarize the doctrine of the Trinity, God is one essence or substance. He is spirit, indivisible, that is simple. God is immaterial, incorporeal, and not composed of parts, whether physically, logically, or metaphysically, and thus cannot be divided in himself under any of those categories. 
Uh, Godhead doctrine states that the substance of the Godhead is composed of three different parts, body, soul, and spirit. While they are always logically and metaphysically divided, they're only sometimes temporally or spatially so. For the Trinity, in this one substance, there are three subsistences, usually referred to as persons, which are distinguished by relative properties or personal relations, and each of which fully possesses the divine essence. Father, Son, and Spirit are each fully God and are personally distinct from the others. Finally, for the Godhead, God is one person, which is composed of three separate parts or things. These parts likewise have a personal relation between themselves, as seen in their acting, communicating, willing, moving, etc.